Good morning. Happy Sabbath. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. Well, God has laid a message on my heart, but I wanted to give you a brief report. And many of you here don't know who I am. You've heard my name. My name is Joe Martin. I'm the director for the Rocky Mountain Conference for Student Literature Evangelism. There has been a program in the Rocky Mountain Conference for 24 years, amen? amen. And we have sent out 1,200 young missionaries in these 24 years to evangelize this conference. And during this time, there's been this strong program here at Campion Academy. And this is where all the programs in North America springboarded from, right here in this place, off this campus. We began trying what we can do with young people, and God has shown himself that God has always had a place for young people in finishing the work so that we can go home, amen? amen. During these 24 years, as I put some of these figures together, they, they amazed me. I'm not one for reporting systems. I just like doing what God has asked me to do. And during these 24 years, these students have sold $4,200,000 worth of truth-filled books. Now here's the good part. $2,100,000 has gone back into our schools with Christian education. These young people have given away in people's hands nearly two million steps to Christ. All over this conference, this past summer was one of the highest summers. 17 kids sold $111,000 worth of books. But more so than that, they found a living experience with Jesus. And I had the privilege of baptizing one of the young ladies. She said, this summer, God... Be and she was raised in the Adventist church. She was raised with all the schools, even going to camp in the academy. She was off to college. But this summer, she found God, amen, for herself. And that's what it's all about, finding God individually to make him real. Well, I don't want to go into too many facts and, and stuff, so I've asked one of my students this school year, Raina Williams, come on up, to give a testimony for Jesus. One testimony. And I can tell you testimonies for hours, but I, when I looked at the clock, I said, what? 12 o'clock? I should have the benediction. But Raina, go ahead. How's my hair look? You look fine. Okay, okay, good. All right, well, um, yesterday Joe asked me to come up here. It was kind of short notice, but he asked me a simple question to answer. And that question was, how has Ellie influenced you spiritually? So as I was thinking about it, it was like, well, how am I supposed to tell all these people how Ellie has influenced me spiritually? It's hard to explain when you're out there going door to door, you see it yourself, but it's harder to explain to people who have never done it before. So as I was reading through my Bible trying to find a verse, I came across this verse and it's found in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, God once said, let the light out of darkness. And this is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts. He gave us light by letting us know the glory of God that is in the face of Christ. So I read this and I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's a really good verse, but what does that have to do with answering this question? So I wanna point out a main sentence in this verse and it is, God made his light shine in our hearts. Um, you know, this verse is kind of how I'm gonna explain Ellie to you. Um, my point is that um, Ellie is the main thing at Campion that has kept God's light shine in my heart. And um, you know, Ellie isn't a job to me. I love going out there and I love talking to people and I love planting those seeds in people's lives that can get them to go to heaven. Um, I have a quick story. Uh, it happened about two or three weeks ago. I was actually working with Joe 
And that normally doesn't happen because normally I have my own team, so I don't work with Joe, but um, this was the first time I was working with him this school year. And we were doing good, you know, going door to door. And we come up to this door, and this lady comes out. Joe gives her the door approach, and he has the cookbook, puts it in her hand, and she's like, okay, you know what, just stop right here. Um, I don't have any money. I have no money. My husband and I just got in a car accident, totaled our car. We're now filing bankruptcy. We have to pay the court $750 every month for a whole year. My water heater just went out. I have been taking showers at my daughter's house, and I haven't eaten lunch in over a week. Joe has the stack of books in his hand, and he shoves them in my arms. I handed them to her. <laughs> that too. <laughs> and normally this doesn't happen, so I was just like, okay, thanks, Joe. And he pulls out his wallet. And I'd never seen this happen before. I was like, what are you doing? And this lady knows what he's doing, and she's like, no, 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 no. I cannot take your money. And long story short, Joe gives her some money, and we pray with her. And we leave. And that's one of those things where if I wouldn't have been working with Joe, I couldn't have given her money because I don't carry my own money around with me. I couldn't have done that. So when we're out there, God has plans for us. He knows exactly what we're going to be doing, and he's right there by our side. And I'm going to wrap it up with saying that I just want to challenge all of you to listen to God's calling. Because for some, it could be, you know, grading papers for teachers at school or working in the office or doing all these other things. But I want to encourage camping students especially that if you feel like God's calling you to do LE or something like that puts you out of your comfort zone, don't ignore it because God will be right there with you every step of the way at every door you go to throughout your whole life. And she was nervous when she got up here. To stand where I'm standing this morning is a sacred responsibility to stand before God's people. So please, pray with me. Father God, you've heard our praises. You've seen your young people in front here to acknowledge you as our great God. Lord, now we want to hear your voice. I pray, Father God, that you would take this vessel. You would empty me of my selfishness, my pride, and that you would be able to speak your words through me, that your people will be blessed, your people will be challenged as we stand in these last days of the world's history, is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I'm not one for looking at clocks. That's why I don't like that clock right there. It's too big. I can see the hands. My friends, Jesus is coming soon. Do I hear an amen? If there is ever a time that we as a people need to get revived, why God is calling us in these last days? Because Jesus is coming. I've been believing that for 39 years that he's coming back. I'm not worried about the time. I'm worried that I want to see my Jesus. Amen? It's been 170 years since 1844 when like believers were studying their Bibles and they came across the truth that Jesus would come. We know he didn't or we wouldn't be here this morning. But my friends, God is calling for a great revival in his church. 
young and old. Little is what was old. My friends, God has no age barrier, but he's calling for the revival that he's been waiting for for many, many years among his people. He gave the promise to us in John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen? That where I am, there ye may be also. My friend, Jesus has never lied to us. In fact, we're told in Titus 2.13 that we should be looking for the second coming of Jesus, looking for the blessed hope, for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be looking, we should be looking, we should be watching for the signs, my friends, that Jesus is coming soon. If you read Matthew 24, we have some signs, my friends, that we're told that will precede the end of time. But my friends, I think sometimes we don't read these things anymore. We're enjoying this world. We're being lax in the church. We're not only to look for, but we're told that we can hasten the second coming of Jesus. Now that scares a lot of people. But the verse says, looking for, 2 Peter 3.12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. We're told in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The sad news, we are still here. But the verse says, when the gospel is preached, you see, my friends, God's spreading the gospel is what God, why God has raised up this church is to spread the gospel. And the gospel, my friends, is the good news about our great God. Amen? Everything we believe should point people to our great God, his love for the human race. He gave his son that none be lost, but that all come to repentance. So now I ask you a question. Well, let me go back first one more time. Jesus gave his, far, his parting words to his disciples when he went back to heaven. And Mark 16, 19, he's leaving to go back. But he says this to the disciples. And they went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. Did you get that? We were never meant to do the work by ourselves. Never. He says, and the Lord worked with them. So here's the question. How did the Lord work with them? Now you read Acts 1.8, and, and it says, and ye shall receive power, and the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses both to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, which includes Loveland, Colorado. Amen? The power. So the next question is, where is the power? We know what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. That's the power. So here's the next verse in Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then being evil, that's us, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Did you get that? Ask him. Ask him. Him. There are many reasons, I believe, why Jesus hasn't come. Some can debate it. That's okay. One is evident. We haven't spread the gospel to the whole world yet. That's evident. It says, when this gospel shall be preached into all the world, then shall the end come. We're still here. So it's evident we haven't done all that God has asked us to do. Another is we haven't asked the Father for the Holy Spirit to be poured out 
like the day of Pentecost. My friends, we're told that in the book called Steps to Christ, those who are waiting for the second coming of Christ will be found in the prayer meeting. Wouldn't it be a new day if on Wednesday evening you same people were here praying together for the power that we need individually to tell somebody about Jesus? Because that's what God's waiting for. He's waiting for a people, my friends. He's waiting for a people who believe what we've been told for years, that Jesus is coming. When's the last time you've told somebody, your friend, do you know that Jesus is coming? Or have we gotten embarrassed because he hasn't come? Revelation 22 says this, Behold, I come quickly. Jesus said that. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the saying of the words of these prophecies. And then in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus, my friends, his time is not our time. Did you get that? But he's waiting for a people. Matthew 24, 44 says this, Therefore be ye ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Be what? Ready. Don't worry about the time. The Bible is very clear. No man knows the day nor the hour, not even the angels. My Father only, Matthew 24, 36. Don't worry about the time. That's God's work. Our work is to be doing what God has called us to do, and that's to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen? So right here, this is our job. To live for Jesus and look for Jesus. And tell somebody about Jesus. As I was thinking this, this morning when I was in, in your, one of your Sabbath school classes and the word came up, doctrines. Oh my friends, we need to erase that word. Not that it's not biblical, we need to say, we have truth all about our Jesus. How about the truth about sleeping in Jesus? That's good news. There's no burning hell forever and ever and ever. The good news is there's going to be a resurrection morning. I can't wait to see my mommy again. Amen? And many, many of you probably have loved ones too. But my friend, a storm is coming upon this world. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Matthew, Jesus tells the story. Matthew 27, and it's very easy. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And every one that heareth these things and doeth them not shall be locked unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. My friends, what Jesus is trying to tell us is that when the storm comes, and it is coming, my brothers and sisters, it might even be coming into your lives right now in different ways, but there is going to be a storm that's going to shake us to our very foundation. And the storm will reveal, the storm will reveal who we know and who our, is our faith in. You see, when the flood came in Noah's time, those who were ready for the flood were in the ark. They were in the ark of safety. My friends, are we with Jesus today in the ark? Of, do we understand our standing with God? Do you have the assurance of eternal life, my friend? Because eternal life is all about God. It's not about us. Do you know Jesus? You see, my friend, and I tell young people all the time, 
You must take the time. You must take the time to know Jesus for yourself. You cannot depend on a minister. You cannot depend upon the evangelist. You can't even depend upon your spouse. You must know Jesus for yourself. Amen? And you see, my friends, as we take time in a relationship, you spend time with somebody. That develops the relationship that ties people together. I did a survey yesterday with some of the students. I won't say their names. And I asked them, give me your schedule of your time at school. And they gave it to me from 6 in the morning to 7. They got to take a shower and put up makeup on. I said, well... That leaves, that leaves the guys out, so they have more time to get ready. And then I went through the whole day schedule with their classes or work and lunch and then band or choir or art or then they're involved in sports and they get, then they got to come back and they got to do the homework for two or three hours and then lights are out. And I thought to myself, they never mentioned Jesus. How many of us say as, as older people are so involved in work, getting so many things done, that we say, where is Jesus? You see, my friends, being ready for the second coming of Christ also means staying ready. Here's the verse. I've asked this question, too, to several people. What is eternal life? Living forever. No, 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 no. Eternal life, living forever, is the benefit. John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is knowing God and Jesus. Amen? If you know Jesus, you're ready for him to come if it might be tomorrow for someone. Knowing Jesus. You see, my friends, understanding all the prophecies, and we need to. We're a church of prophecy. We're founded on prophecy. God called this church for a purpose. We're not called just to look nice every Sabbath morning. We haven't been called to just have this beautiful building as good as these things are. We've been called for a purpose. We've been called to tell people about Jesus. Everything we do should be focused on Jesus. Whether we're singing, whether we're, we're going out and feeding the hungry, it should be helping them to see a picture of Jesus. Not us, not this building. You see, and knowing Jesus, that's the relationship, you become like him. Did you get that? Spending time with Jesus, you become like him. That's the goal, is to be just like Jesus. So people see, can see Jesus. They can see, did you get that? People can see Jesus because they see you. You're kind, you're honest, you're respectful, you're loving, you're compassionate. It's all about revealing the God that we say we believe in. It's not about revealing the church. It's about revealing Jesus to a lost world that's dying many millions without Jesus. Now, for my last verses, some of you have Bibles, some have iPads, I don't know anymore what people are doing with, with the holding their hands, even their phones. Have mercy. It's over my head. But let me read these verses first. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son has life. These things have I written unto you that I believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may what? Know that you have eternal life. My friends, I know I have eternal life because I have Jesus. Amen? That's my assurance. It's not what I do right. It's what I 
who I know that is right. That's his righteousness. And when you know Jesus, my friends, when you know Jesus, it's got to come out of you. It can't just be dormant. Then there's something missing. Then you're just a religionist. And the world is tired of religion. Young people, my friends, hear me, old people. That includes me. Young people are wanting to see something real. Not just rules. Even though the rules might be still good. They need to see someone who cares and someone who loves. Let me read to you now, First John. This is the verse that just, it's just one of my most favorite verses in all the Bible. It's First John chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. You got to catch a vision of these verses, my friends. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, here's, now here's, like Paul Harvey says to you old people, the young people don't know who Paul Harvey is, but listen. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The rest of the story, it's a promise. We will be like Jesus. He says so. He's never lied to us. He's coming back. And when he comes back, we will be like him. You know why we're going to be like him? My friends, because we're spending time with him. We're having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you're having a relationship with Jesus Christ, my friends, the window's wide open to tell the world about Jesus. That's what he's waiting for. Not new technology. We have so much technology, then why hasn't the whole world been told? Because there are people, as Raina said, we knock on doors every day, and there's people who don't go to church. There's people who don't believe in God. There's people who go to other religions that don't believe in the God that we believe in. And they buy a book about Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. You, you know, the number, the number two books that we sell with students is Desire of Ages, Great Controversy, and Third one, step to Christ. We give a book to everybody we see. If they're walking their dog down the street, they get a book. If they're, walk, if they're pushing their kids, they get a book. If they're going to the bus stop with their kids, they get a book. That's literature evangelism. My friends, the Lord is waiting for us to come back into that relationship that he's hungering and he's desiring for. He wants none to be lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm watching that clock and it doesn't, it gets me nervous. The conference knows when they ask me to give a talk, don't, don't tell me 10 minutes. And they expect 25 at least. But my friends, God is waiting for the revival. Don't worry about the church in Loveland. Don't worry about the church in Longmont. Don't worry about any church in the conference, my friend. God is not telling us to worry about the other churches. He said, this church needs to be revived, amen? And don't say we don't need to be revived, because if we don't, he would have come back. And this place would be filled. There would be a second service. My friends, we need to get on our knees before God like never before. And I'll put a plug in for Pastor Goya that's coming for this, this prayer seminar. I've heard him personally. Oh, you don't want to miss him. You are going to be tremendously blessed with a man of prayer. But my friends, we've been called to pray too. His house has been told to be called a house of prayer. We have been called, my friends, to tell the world about Jesus. But my friends, we must know him first. Amen? 
We must take the time. You must revive your own self. You want a reformation? You want to become a vegetarian? My friends, fall in love with Jesus first. Amen? And if God calls you there, then you go there because you love him. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Everything Jesus says, you're willing to do because you love Jesus. We need to be revived in our own personal relationships with Jesus. I encourage students, get your Bibles out. If all you do is read one verse a day, praise God. It will develop in the two and three and four and five. And I talked to one student this, this past week, and they spend 20 minutes every morning in their Bibles before they go to school. Is that good news, parents, teachers? We need, my friends, that closer relationship with Jesus because the storm is coming. As we said earlier, if not, this Bible is false. It calls it a time of trouble that this world has never known. And like that lady who told us all her troubles, have mercy. I couldn't imagine, where do you go next? Bankruptcy, car no good, no money. And when she told me that she hadn't eaten lunch for a week or so because she had no money, and the Lord told me, Joe, you got money. I said, yes, Jesus. I didn't give it to her for brownie points. I gave it to her because she was a lady in need. And then I gave her a step to Christ. But I guarantee you, she's going to read that book. And she's going to think about our visit. My friends, it's going to take individual desires to revive a church. Is it your desire this morning to be ready to see Jesus? Then I'm going to ask you to stand up if it's your desire. Don't stand up because your friends are standing up. God knows it. He wants you to stand up because you want to be ready for the second coming of Christ. And in your own hearts right now this morning, will you commit yourself afresh to him? Will you say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me? And thank you for being my Savior, Jesus, that I'm going to heaven because of Jesus? And then you ask Jesus in your own heart this morning, what more can I do for you, my Jesus? He might ask you to come up here. He might ask you to do something you've never even thought about. But my friends, when you're willing, God takes care of you. I want to pray for you. Father God, you see those who have stood to their feet. You know the hearts of every person in this place this morning. Lord, we've believed this message for so many years. And Lord, we're getting complacent. Lord, revive us as a people individually. Lord, we've lacked and our time with you. We think this world is so important. Students need to see that school is not as important as falling in love with you. So Father God, accept your standing people this morning. And I pray, Lord, for that gift that you promised, the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father God, that this morning, as eyes are closed, they can sense your Holy Spirit now coming into them. Because I'm asking it. You said, ask, Father. Believing, we shall receive. So, Father God, I'm praying for the Holy Ghost to take hold of this church, the Campion Church. You've placed it to be a light on this hill. Not just for the community, Father, but for our young people. So, Father God, accept us because we come to you in the name of Jesus, amen.
Please remain standing as we sing all four stanzas of Jesus is Coming Again, hymn number 213.